Oh, Happy well, New Year! Happy New Year! We have we have made it to 2022. How, and how does it feel? <laughs> how does it feel being in 2022, Jenny? We have to be honest. We're filming this before <laughs> the New Year. How's your Christmas, KJ? It, I gotta be honest. <laughs> It hasn't happened it's yet. <laughs> filming before Christmas, too. Yes. It's planning ahead. Thinking about, about January the 2nd, yeah. January 3rd, January 4th. The times that you're engaging this, mm -hmm. the two of us and Pastor Alan are here like preparing it ahead yeah. of time so it can be awesome for yes. you. Yeah. And, um, this, and today's going to be good. So if the apocalypse happened and, <laughs> and this doesn't actually show? Wow. It, it could happen. <laughs> I'm all set. <laughs> I know you are. <laughs> hey guys, but today is going to be a good day. Alan is um, bringing us kind of a vision, like a vision for this year, um, and just kind of leading us into this uh, new season of family. And so I'm really, I'm excited for him to kind of set the table for what this next series is going to be. And yeah. I think it's, here, here's some the thing I'm excited about, I'm just going to expand just a little bit because there's time to do it. I mean, come on. <laughs> we've got, um, we've got, all, we've got all the time, the time in the world. <laughs> Thanks for paying attention. It, it, um, so post the COVID mm -hmm. season, church has felt, you know, kind of mm -hmm. different. Like things have changed in culture, things have changed yeah. in church, and things have, I mean, like people have changed. And I've been like, you know, who is a church supposed to be? Mm -hmm. So is there a trajectory the church is going to be on that's different than how the church has been on, on the past and all those different things. Yeah. And so to be able um, to begin 2022, but by doing a sermon series, just talking about the heart and soul of here's our church, here's our trajectory, mm -hmm. here's our path, mm -hmm. here's our heart. It's like, yes. Yeah. Thank you. Mm -hmm. So I'm excited. And I love, he's going to bring some questions in this one. And it's, are, what you, is your are name? you asking the right questions <laughs> right. For this year? And it's, yeah. So get ready to really be starting to meditate on those. And yeah, enjoy. Hey, Christ community, happy new year to all of you. I'm excited about what God has in store for us as a church this coming year. I wanted to mention that next week, we're going to be doing three days of seeking God. So Monday, Tuesday, Wednesday, January 10th through the 12th, we encourage you to fast for all or part of those days and then join us for a prayer gathering on Wednesday night as we as we bring the three days to a culmination. There are details about that in your newsletter. What a great way to begin the year. You know, one of the things I love about the first part of a new year is that it provides this unique opportunity for each of us to stop and really kind of evaluate our lives. It's like we all have this new start and we can and, and we can impact really the trajectory of our lives by leveraging this moment. I mean, the, the reality is so often we we just get so busy with life and we find ourselves kind of stuck in this day-to-day, week-to-week, month-to-month routine without really thinking strategically about where we're headed. I remember um, reading about a sign on some remote dirt road in Montana. The sign read, choose your rut carefully. You're going to be in it for the next 34 miles. You know, the, the, the first part of a new year provides this really cool and significant opportunity for us to choose the path we're going to be on for the next several months, to not just keep going with the way things have been going, but to perhaps choose some course corrections that help us more fully flourish in our lives. Now, the key to that actually happening is found in a very simple strategic, and yet often underutilized practice. And that is the power of asking questions, asking the right questions. How many medical or technological advancements that we benefit from are the result of someone stopping to ask a question? How can we fix this? How can we do this better? How can we improve this process? How can we better serve people? I mean, questions are an incredibly potent thing. If we're willing to ask them, and take the time to and to explore the answer. And this is where having a relationship with Jesus becomes so awesome. Because when you have a relationship with Jesus, you now have someone to help you process and answer these questions. 
so that the answers provide this pathway to a life of flourishing, a life of wholeness. So today, I want us to explore three incredibly strategic and important questions for us to be asking at the start of this new year. Questions that can have a huge impact on the trajectory of our lives, both together as a church and on us as individuals. I want to start with two questions that enable us to slow down and explore our own soul. And then we're going to look at a third question that enables us to slow down and explore the soul of our church. Okay, the first question is found in Genesis chapter 3, immediately after Adam and Eve chose to rebel against God. They were instantly filled with shame and remorse, and they hid from the Lord. And so God goes looking for them. And in his pursuit of them, he asks this very specific question, where are you? Where are you? I love this question. I mean, here is God who created the universe. He knows all things. He's asking Adam and Eve, where are you? This is not a geographical question. He knows exactly where they are in terms of their physical location. Nor is this a rhetorical question, one that doesn't need to be answered. No, this is a question God wants Adam and Eve to answer in the midst of their situation. He wants them to stop hiding and to honestly look at their hearts by answering this question, where are you? And this is a question that God wants us to answer as well. Where are you? Not where are you geographically or vocationally. <clears throat> he already knows that. This question is about our soul. I mean, what is really going on inside of us? What, what are we feeling? What are we thinking? What are we experiencing? So often we live our lives at such a frenetic pace, filling every moment with activity. And then when we do have some downtime, we find some diversion like social media or Netflix or whatever. And what, what happens over time is that we never stop long enough to check in with our soul, to honestly look at our heart. What are we feeling? Maybe we're feeling sad, but we try to keep busy so we don't feel that. Maybe we're feeling lonely. Maybe we're feeling exhausted. Maybe we're feeling distant from God because of some failures in our lives. So we just keep busy to avoid these feelings of shame. Maybe we're feeling anxious or fearful about something. Are we willing to take some time to be still in God's presence and to quiet our hearts and to ask ourselves this question, where am I? How is my soul? How am I doing really? Now, for some of us, that might be a scary question to ask, but it's so life-giving and important. To continue to ignore our hearts is a guaranteed way to stay in a rut and keep going on a life trajectory that doesn't reflect God's heart for us. So the first step toward wholeness is in slowing down long enough to acknowledge where we really are. No more hiding, no more pretending. Where am I? How am I really doing? You know, when I'm driving somewhere and I get lost, I have two instinctive reactions that I kind of have to choose between. One reaction is just keep driving and you'll figure it out, right? I mean, ultimately, that's my, ultimately, that's often my default reaction. The other reaction is to slow down, to stop, pull into a parking lot, get my phone, you know, map out and figure out where I am. And now you'd think that would be an easy choice, but it's not always because usually I'm in a hurry. I want to get to my destination, but what a difference it can make to take a small amount of time and to figure out exactly where I am. And the same thing is true for our soul, especially at the start of this new year. Take some time to get alone with Jesus and explore this question, where am I in my life, in my heart, in my relationship with God? You know, the beautiful thing about answering that question is that once we do that, Jesus is able to meet us in that place. I mean, how, how can Jesus meet us in a place that we aren't even willing to acknowledge is there? But once we see it and own it, he then can do his work. And this is true even in our shame and our failure and our regrets. I mean, God knew what Adam and Eve had done but he still moved towards them. He clothed them. He spoke to them. All right, so once we've asked this question, where are you or where am I? The second, there's a second question that naturally follows and can be 
equally powerful. This is a question that Jesus asked someone in John chapter 1. Jesus was walking by John the Baptist who made the comment, look, the Lamb of God. And two of John's disciples heard John say that, and they decided to follow Jesus and to find out more about him. So Jesus sees them following him, and he turns to them and he asks this question, what do you want? Now, this is not a, what do you want, kind of an irritated sort of question. No, this was a question that Jesus asked in order to explore their heart, their longings, their desires. I believe Jesus is asking the same question of us today as we begin this new year. Once we've established where we are, first question, the second question can be so powerful. What do you want? What desires and longings are stirring in your heart? I love this question. It's a question that we as Christians often don't ask ourselves, right? I mean, typically, we ask questions that focus on ought tos and shoulds, you know, especially this time of year. I should exercise more. I should read my Bible more. I mean, lots of New Year's resolutions are rooted in guilt and ought tos and shoulds, which is why they often don't have a lasting impact. Now, what can have a lasting impact is when we tune in to the desires of our heart. What do I want? What kind of person do I want to be? What, what kind of life am I longing for? These kinds of questions are inspiring. I can think of a couple conversations I've had recently with people. One, one was a friend who acknowledged he hadn't had a quiet time with the Lord in months. And, and he was saying, yeah, I really need to do that. And as I heard him say that, I was thinking to myself, I don't think anything's ever going to change. So then I said to him, hey, listen, rather than feeling like this is something you know you should do, what if you reframed the question? What if you rephrased the question in this way? What kind of relationship with Jesus do you want? And what intentional steps would help make that happen? See, by changing the question, we suddenly engage our hearts, we engage our desires, we engage you know, our longings in a, in a positive way. This kind of question enables us to, to dream of what could be and, and to pursue these good things that God has laid or is laying on our heart. Again, our, our, our tendency as human beings is to just keep going in our day-to-day -day lives and we get into a rut where our desires and our dreams can easily sort of get put on a shelf. So one of the most powerful questions you can ask yourself right here at the start of this new year is this, what do I want? What do I want my relationship with Jesus to be like? What do I want my experience of friendship to be like? What area of my life do I want to grow in as a person that I want to experience more freedom in? What dreams do I want to pursue? Now, for some of us, this question may feel a little scary. Can I trust my heart? The answer is absolutely. But the Bible tells us that when we are in Christ, we are given a new heart with new desires and that Jesus actually lives in our heart. So, so as we tune into his presence within us, our hearts align with him. I love how St. Augustine articulated this. He once wrote, love God and do as you please. I love that. Love God and do as you please. In other words, when we are loving God with all of our being, what we want is what God wants. So as you are loving God, Tune in to the desires of your heart. What do you really want? Do, do, do you want deeper friendships? Do you want freedom from some addiction? Do you want to step out of your comfort zone and get involved in some ministry? Do, do you want a closer relationship with Jesus? Do you want to explore a new career path? What is a desire that is stirring in your heart? And what would it look like to then pursue that desire? So I want to encourage you, I encourage you to take some time in the next few days and ask this question, what do I want? Now, the third question that I think is so powerful for us to ask at the start of a new year has to do with our church. What is our purpose as a church? Why does Christ community exist? 
I mean, this is a really important question for all of us who, who, um, for all of us to really look at periodically, because when we begin to lose sight of our purpose as a church, we can easily, each one of us, we can easily begin to disengage from church. Or we can find ourselves just going through the motions and losing sight of what God is calling us to be part of together. So I wanted to take the remaining time we have here and focus on this question. What is our purpose as a church? How would we succinctly describe our why? Why does Christ's community exist? Well, this is a question that our core leadership team has intentionally been going after for the past few months. I mean, again, how can we in a couple words describe the heartbeat and vision that we're pursuing? And after lots of prayer and processing among um, the nine of us as leaders, the two words begin to emerge that we feel encapsulate our why, our purpose as a church. And these two words are, are experience life. Experience life. When we think about our passion and heartbeat as a church and the journey that we've been on and continue are continuing on, it, it is ultimately about this desire to experience life. I mean, isn't that what every human being longs for and yet struggles to find? And yet we know where to find life. There's this fascinating passage in John 10, 10, where Jesus makes this astounding statement. Look, look, look with me at this. He, he, he says, the thief comes only to steal and kill and destroy. I have come that they may have life and have it to the full. The thief Jesus is referring to is our enemy, the devil, whose sole purpose is evil. He uses his lies to steal and destroy. He wants to damage, diminish, hinder the loving purposes of God in the life of every human being. That's his mission. And he's really good at it. He's like a spiritual ISIS director, right? Leading this underground terrorist organization that's fighting God by robbing us of wholeness and life. So in contrast to that, Jesus says, I have come that they may have life and have it to the full. This word life is the Greek word Zoe, from which we get the down the name of our downtown coffee shop and event center, Zoe's. But th- this word speaks specifically to a quality of life. Jesus, Jesus says here that his purpose is that we may experience life to the full. He's describing a life of wholeness, of shalom, of thriving, of, of an abundance of joy and peace and purpose. That's what Jesus says his purpose is, to bring that kind of life into the human experience. And we, as a church, we want to join him in that mission, in that journey. We want to experience that abundance of life, and we want others to experience that as well. So how are we going after this as a church? How are we as a church helping people grow in their experience of life in Christ. Well, two and a half years ago, BC, before COVID, we began to identify three core essentials of what it looks like to truly follow Jesus and in doing so to experience life. First, all things with Christ. To experience life is to enjoy an intimate relationship with Jesus, where he is a vital part of every aspect of your life. Not only spiritual things like prayer and worship and going to church, but also things like work, going to school, or folding laundry, or playing sports, or watching a movie, or whatever. All, and all things with, li- with Christ lifestyle means inviting Jesus to be a vital part of every aspect of our lives, living in an experiential relationship with him. Here's how Jesus describes this in John 15. He says, I am the vine, you are the branches. If a man, if, if, if you remain in me and I in you, you will bear much fruit. Apart from me, you can do nothing. See, Jesus invites us to experience a life of continual connectedness to him, where his life and his love flows in and through us, through the presence of his spirit. This is something we as a church are going after together, that that, that we all can grow in our experience of Jesus' incredible love for us, that his love can begin to heal our heart wounds and fill 
are places of insecurity and fear, that, that his love moves and empowers us to walk in his goodness and purity and in our actions and our words and our thoughts so that everything we do is a spiritual activity, all things with Christ. We as a church want to help people grow in this intimate relationship with Jesus. This is why our teachings often conclude with a time of listening to Jesus speak to our hearts. This is why we offer a course on how to experience intimacy with Jesus. This is why we have a prayer ministry to help people experience inner healing in those places in their lives where they feel stuck. See, we want to do all we can to help people experience wholeness and freedom in Jesus. In other words, to experience life, all things with Christ. The second core aspect of how we as a church are helping people experience life is described in the phrase, as a thriving family. See, the life Jesus invites us into when we place our faith in him is not a life of independence, just me and Jesus. No, when we place our trust in Jesus, we actually become a part of God's family. He is our father. We are his children, which means we have lots of brothers and sisters. All these other other believers are brothers and sisters. And so the church can become this beautiful, powerful expression of God's family on earth as we live out these relational dynamics that reflect the Father's heart. Things like love, where every person is loved and delighted in, no matter what their lifestyle or political views or economic status. A safe place where people can be real and be known, where we can be vulnerable and where empathy is demonstrated, where needs can be met. This family is also a place where truth is spoken in love. And where, God, and where conflicts are resolved in a healthy way and where transformation can happen in people's lives. I mean, can you imagine the impact, especially in our society today, of a church that is truly living out these values, that is committed to being this kind of thriving family? I had a guy come up to me in the lobby a few weeks ago, and he was just thanking me expressing gratitude it wasn't about me, but just expressing gratitude for the way this church family is helping him walk through a life crisis. I mean, this is the kind of church we're, we're striving to be. That's what families do. So when you're saying yes to Christ's community, you are saying yes to together growing towards this vision. And in doing so, we experience life, the life that the Father, Son, and Holy Spirit experience. Now, by the way, I'm super excited about a new teaching series that we're starting next week entitled Together, Rediscovering Authentic Connection. We're going to be talking about how we can grow in our experience of these kinds of thriving relationships and this kind of healthy connection with others. All things with Christ as a thriving family. There's one other core aspect of how we as a church are wanting to experience life, and that is found in the phrase, bringing hope to all people. This is God's ultimate objective. This is his ultimate plan. I mean, think about this. His plan begins with individuals like you and me who place our trust in Christ and, and we receive his love and his life. And we walk in the spirit and God then takes those individuals and he places them in, in his family, i.e. the church, where they can live out this love that they've experienced in their relationship with God, where they're devoted to one another and forgiving one another. They're working through conflicts and serving one another and all that, which is a beautiful thing, but that's not the end goal. The, the reason God put his people into this family is so that they can together reach out to the world around them with the gospel of Jesus and enfold others into this family. So what this means is that people may experience belonging to this family before they even believe in Jesus. Our greatest witness to the world is to be this loving family whose, whose heart is to enfold others into this family. Now, this enfolding simply involves building relationships with people, all of us, building relationships with people, opening our hearts to them, loving them. It, it doesn't require a special level of training or a seminary degree. I mean, the reality is every one of us as Christ followers are carriers of hope to this world. All of us, we are all carriers of hope to this world. Every one of us is a missionary in our family, in our neighborhood, in our school, in our workplace, in our golf league, our book club. I mean, Jesus said it so clearly, as the Father has sent me, 
I am sending you. See, we get to join Jesus in his mission. We are all sent by Jesus to love the world around us. Or again, the way we say it is bringing hope to all people. We have a group that feeds the homeless on, on Saturday mornings once a month. We have, we have a, a dozens of tutors who mentor at-risk children at, at, at Maplewood Elementary. Others in our church are opening their homes and hospitality to neighbors and coworkers. I mean, can you imagine with me the impact if every one of us saw ourselves as hope carriers? I mean, talk about experiencing life. This is where genuine life is found. Life is not found in living for ourselves, hoarding our resources, making sure our lives, that our lives are comfortable. No, life is found when we give ourselves away, when we move toward lost people in love, when we open our homes and share a meal with someone who is very different than us. I am so excited about the purpose God is calling us as a church to pursue to experience life, a full, abundant life in Jesus. And I'm, I'm also excited about how he is calling us to pursue that purpose. All things with Christ as a thriving family, bringing hope to all people. You are a crucial part of this journey. This is the life we are pursuing together as a church family. I, I, I can't wait to see what God has in store for us this coming year as we pursue this purpose together. Let's experience life. All right, would you pray with me? So as we are beginning this new year, I want us right now, as you're watching this, I, I want to encourage all of us to stop and begin to ask the Lord these two questions that we just talked about a few minutes ago. First question, where am I? Where are you? Where, where is your soul right now? Just take a moment and ask that question. Second question, what do I want? What do I want? What desires, what dreams, what longings are being stirred in you and me? Just ask the Lord that. Tune into that part of your heart right now. Father, I pray that we would all take some more time. This was kind of short, but we would all take some more time to process these questions with you. <clears throat> we consecrate this new year to you. Would you meet us where we're at and move us to where you want us to be? I pray that for all of us, Lord. And we pray too for our church and this vision that you've given us, this vision to experience life. Jesus, thank you for offering us abundant life in you. And we pray, we pray together for the vision you're calling us to pursue, all things with Christ, that we would grow in intimacy with you, Jesus, in every part of our lives. As a thriving family, that we as a church would grow in our experience of being connected, relationally connected as family with one another. And third, bringing hope to all people. Lord, help us all be hope carriers to the people around us, loving them with the love that you have poured into our hearts. So we love you. We consecrate this year to you. Pray that you would do above and beyond what we can even ask or imagine. In Jesus' name we pray. Amen. Hey, we're all here now. Welcome. Thank you, Alan, for yes. that. I love this time of year. Um, 
I, I used to hate it. I used to not be like a goal setter or anything like that. And last year, I actually challenged myself to do that. Mm -hmm. And then I understood the benefits <laughs> of doing that. Um, but I love this time. I love what you're doing rather than, you know, talking about like goals and necessarily things like that. But asking these questions, what do I want? Where mm -hmm. do I want to pursue something or more of my faith or, you know, anything? And I feel like this this year in particular, um, just because of everything that's happened, I feel like we have more of that freedom yep. to do that. And I love just mm. being in the space of like, it feels like there's more possibilities, I guess. Oh, that's interesting. Is what I would Compared say. Compared to 2020. Yeah. We were ending 2020 last year. And yeah. That's a good point. Goals were very different at the uh -huh. end. Yeah. I do think there's something... It struck me too of just the shift in a want to versus a not to mm -hmm. with goals and New Year's resolutions. And um, when you tap in, I think sometimes we're afraid of our desires, but when we tap in to our desires, some powerful things can mm -hmm. happen. So I was, I, I have a son that's 14, and in September he began like body building. <laughs> And like, I love the way you do that. Like, I, I don't get it. It's, it's, it's like something. So you're I, super supportive. Is what well, you're I am. I'm trying yes. to support him. But, but he's begun bodybuilding. Sure. He's he's spending his cash on protein powder, and Good. he goes to the gym each day. And I bring up sometimes like, so have you ever thought about playing a sport? Or and uh -huh. he just does not have it as this is his all. sport. And and then I. I just, I don't understand the thing behind the thing. And he says, Dad, I'm just doing it to be healthy. Oh. And like, there's this desire to be healthy instead of the ulterior motive of I'm, <laughs> I'm, I'm bodybuilding so I can be competitive, so I can right. da, 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 da. It is just. Yeah. Yes. And so during the sermon, I was thinking kind of the same thing, um, how, how sometimes uh, people who have a quiet time have the thing behind the thing that they're hoping for, or they're doing it because they should. I, I, I'm trying to be healthy because I should be healthy, but mm -hmm. I really hate it. Right. Um, Zion enjoys being healthy. And so mm -hmm. thinking about just this idea of being whole and having Jesus by our side and sitting in, our, is sitting in his presence because it's good. Um, compared to I should. Mm -hmm. And like that idea was just it's, just, it's it's just a huge concept, mm -hmm. I think. It is. I think it opens up the door to when you think about a quiet time or whatever, if if it's not working for someone, they want to grow in Jesus, but it's not working, then I think they can actually ask that question, what do I want my time with Jesus to look like? Yeah. yeah. Maybe I'm going to run or I'm going to take a walk right. or I'm going to grab a cup of coffee and sit in my favorite chair or maybe, you know, all of a sudden... It's like, how would I want to hang out mm -hmm. rather than, oh, I'm supposed to have a quiet time. It's supposed to look like so-and-so's. Mm -hmm. No? What is stirring in your heart in your relationship with Jesus? I mean, I think that's pretty empowering. I mean, like, oh my there gosh, are people yes. who feel like they should get up at 4 a.m. Yep. and carve out a half an hour with Jesus, but they're barely alive at four. And, and this they feels think, miserable. And there's like, they're checking that box. And mm -hmm. furthermore, they hate checking that box compared to it's possible it would be better to do it at 7 mm -hmm. p.m. and you yeah. take a hike and that, that's the thing you do, you know? Right. And, and then it's personal compared to somebody else's. Exactly. And I'm not, I'm just not sure... I don't know how often we stop. It, there is kind of a discipline to stopping mm -hmm. and asking questions, right? Yep. Either one of those yeah. questions, it's they're not easy questions to ask. They can be life-giving, but I wonder if sometimes just the busyness of life um, keeps us from really just stopping mm -hmm. and taking 15 minutes or whatever and actually asking our heart these things. Mm -hmm. I think, too, when you... The whole, like, idea of setting a goal or, you know, setting something that you want to do different, dream, whatever it might be. I always have this, like, internal, when you say people are afraid of it, you know, because I'm afraid of the failure in it, you know. Mm -hmm. I don't want to tell people about it. Mm -hmm. I don't want to, 
you know, yep. even voice it to myself because if I don't follow through, then like, how am I going to feel about myself? You know, that's like my, mm -hmm. my struggle. And I'm sure other people do that as well. But it's getting to this place of um, being okay when you don't necessarily do it perfectly. Being okay with what it actually might turn into, because I think mm. sometimes it can morph and change. Yep. Um, and I, I think I've brought this up. I don't even know if it's here or whatever, but at my gym, when you leave the locker room, it's every time it just says, remember why you started. And I mm. love, love, huh. love that. It's just a little piece of art. And it just, it brings you back to the first day you were there to mm. remember the reason why you decided, you know, rather yeah. than like, okay, I got to go do this. You know, I'm paying a monthly fee, <laughs> you know? but I just love that. And I think I'm thinking about that, you know, that sign with this, like, just keep remembering why you started, you know, why, because I asked this question, because I sought, you know, an answer for this. So I like that. That's good. I also so I was thinking um, that because uh, uh, of the pace of things, um, so, so people actually, they often see the things that they're trying to find, or they hear the things that they're, they're trying to pay attention to. But if you're, uh, it, it's like, it's like, I feel like, so if, if God is calling out, like, where are you? I mean, like, do I have the ability to turn towards him so I can hear that? Mm. Um, because Adam didn't pause and ask that. It's God's, like, God's going through the garden calling out, mm. where are you? Wow. And had the intent to be heard. So it caused a, wait a second, I am here, you know, type of thing. And so oh, do wow. I have space to hear the call of God? Wow. I really like that. You know? That's yeah. so powerful. It does feel different when you quiet yourself and let and ask the, have the Lord ask that question <laughs> versus, <laughs> okay, I'm going to ask myself this question. Where, where am, am I? I? Yeah. But it's like, what is God? Where are you? What is God saying? Yeah. That's pretty powerful. And and then if in taking the same thing to the other question, question like who asked that? Like Jesus, Jesus is did. is standing there saying, what do, you want, what, "What do you want from me?" And like so, picturing Shifting, him there, yeah. just like inviting you in. I love that. What do you want from Who's me? It's like, man, it's going to be a good day today yeah. because he asked the question. You know, like right. I don't know, like ooh. That's, That's like, great. I love that. Not afraid of that answer. <laughs> Seeking that answer. Yeah. I mean, but it is a complex thing, though. Sure. I mean, especially in the context for discipleship. Mm -hmm. I mean, like, man, that's a whole other ballgame there. But I think it's kind of fun to, you know, begin to journey down that. Because the whole, this whole idea, idea of the first sermon for 2022 and painting this vision mm -hmm. that there's Which a I'm point so excited in painting about. the vision, right? Yes. It's like there's a place to go. There's yes. things to be had. There, I mean, like God's doing things. Mm -hmm. Our goal isn't to continue just to do the same do thing, the things, to end up uh -huh. in the same place and check all the boxes. It's mm -hmm. like the boxes are falling off the table <laughs> and new ones are God. coming in. Yeah. Yes. So the possibility, yeah, just the possibilities yep. um, for the new year. That's cool. I love that perspective. Um, so, so, so from the, the, the senior pastor's perspective here, if, if you could just ball up here in 25 seconds, kind of like, here's m my heart's desire mm -hmm. um, for, uh, for, for for us today yeah. and how to engage this. How would that come out? That's 
good. I think just creating, my heart's desire is just for us to continue to hear Jesus speak to us and ask us questions mm -hmm. and follow him into what he's um, inviting us to experience with him. Um, so that would be my encouragement is just take some time and let Jesus speak to your heart. Let your heart speak to him and see what happens. That's awesome. I love that. Same for our church too. Like I love, I love that you ask the question that it's not only just for yourself, but just for us as a church family yep. and being able to like all journey through this at the same time. Um, yeah. As a, as a joint family and then as an individual and yep. how God's going to work in that. And I think there's something so powerful when we all come together and are praying for the same thing and the same purpose. Yes. And like that's huge. And we've seen it time and time again over these past years and just how God works in that. Yep. And, you know, even just the pictures and the things that people send to us of like, this is what I see. This is what I, you know, like yes. it's been powerful. Yeah. So I'm, I'm looking forward to having that sense of like, God, you're here, you are working and you are moving us forward together. Amen. I'm excited it. to, I, like, um, it's so easy to forget yes. God's heart for the church. Yes. Um, because it's so individualistic, like God's heart for me, God's heart for me. Right. Yeah. And a, a ton of like theology, it's corporate, it's corporate theology, you know, it's God speaking to the church, you yes. know, and, and it's so easy to forget that. And I am so excited that a core, a, a huge core value and a core purpose for our church is to be a family because it's so easy to come here and you don't have a clue who other people are and you don't even care mm -hmm. you know and so it's bringing it up it's important to care in fact that's a huge part of experiencing the gospel it's yeah. experiencing our family yeah. yep. so Ooh. i am so excited for that yes well, thank you, Alan. Absolutely. I'm ready for thank 2022. You guys. Cool. <laughs> I don't think that you have a choice, Jenny. So uh, here we go. Here we go. Bye, guys. Thank Bye. you.